international relations in the digital world. How are political decisions influenced by the new media landscape and an interactive society? Media and foreign policy in the digital age. The subject up for debate at the Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum 2015. From the 22nd to the 24th of June in Bonn. Welcome back. I hope you've had a stimulating final workshop here. But it is now time to come to the closing ceremony of the Global Media Forum 2015. In about 40 minutes from now, we'll be getting a summary of proceedings from our social media team. They'll be telling us what's been happening on Twitter and Facebook. And then we'll be hearing some concluding remarks from DW's Director General, Peter Limborg. But first, it is my great honor to introduce our closing keynote speaker. She is a woman of great stature, a tireless campaigner for world peace, and for many, a source of inspiration. She's distinguished her herself in countless ways. She's been nominated for no fewer than three, for the Nobel Peace Prize, no fewer than three times. She's founded multiple civil society organizations, including the renowned think tank, the Oxford Research Group. And she's advised Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Sir Richard Branson in setting up the elders, the elders being a group of renowned individuals with deep experience and wisdom, one assumes, providing counsel to international leaders. And she herself is a counselor of the World Future Council. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Scylla Elworthy. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to look around this gathering and see the mix of gender, age, and every corner of the world pretty much represented. Uh, so I congratulate Deutsche Welle on doing this so efficiently. Um, what I was asked to talk about is how business people can devote their skills to the good of the planet. But before I pose the how question, I want to invite you to examine why they should do this and what they might do. So let's start with the why. The first reason is that business leaders are needed. Many business people do not yet recognize how bad things are. I don't really need to rehearse that in detail with you, but let me just run through a few facts. Our world faces multiple crises, and attempts to address them are not working. The richest 300 people in the world now have more wealth than the poorest 3 billion. That's nearly half of humanity, and a perfect recipe for violence. And we're ruining our planet at a faster rate than most people can imagine. Large parts of it are becoming, becoming uninhabitable. Soils and forests are disappearing. Disastrous crises lurch through unstable financial markets. And the disenfranchised vent their anger at oppressive governments. An economic system rewards the greedy and amoral. And more than a billion people, no longer able to support themselves in rural areas, are swarming towards cities where there's no work for them. 87% of the world's oceans are now overexploited or fully exploited, and that means there are no fish left in the sea. O oceans are literally being vacuumed of fish. Let me tell you a story to illustrate this. Ivan McFadden has twice raced a yacht from Melbourne to Japan. The first time, 10 years ago, he regularly saw turtles, dolphins, and great flurries of feeding birds. But this time, last year, for 3,000 nautical miles, there was nothing, he said, alive 
to be seen. What he did notice, however, is floating plastic debris everywhere. And that explains the scarcity of maritime creatures, along with overfishing, of course. Albatrosses, for example, mistake plastic debris for food and give it to their young. And I quote, chicks starve with full bellies, and when their bodies rot away, they leave tragic piles of bottle tops, pens, cigarette lighters, and plastic fragments to bleach in the sun. Now, returning to our title, company directors of shipping companies, insurance companies, trawler companies, and plastic manufacturers can all act in innovative ways to stop this ocean garbage. Moving to the second reason why it's in the interests of business to consider the planet is that millennials don't want to work for dated companies. By 2020, those born between 1980 and 2000 will form 50% of the global workforce and will be the largest consumer class. Attracting and keeping millennials is giving CEOs sleepless nights. Why? Because, as they say, and I quote, an overwhelming 75% of us believe that businesses are focused on their own agendas rather than helping to improve societies. A recent survey showed that millennials have four major priorities, planet, people, purpose, and then profit. Planet, millennials worldwide consider environmental protection, addressing climate change, resource scarcity, and biodiversity loss as their number one priority. People, inequality of income and wealth, and unemployment are their next concern. Purpose, personal and professional development, coaching and learning are important for more than 50% of millennials. They prefer to work with organizations that are ethical, transparent, and investing in their staff. And the lastly, profit. This is the lowest priority for most millennials globally. They only consider it important in as far as it sustains their cost and standard of living. My third message to business leaders would be this. Networked, networked global social movements may have your number. Social movements such as AVAS are growing by one million members a month. And in 2014, they drove the largest climate mobilization in history, with 675,000 people in the streets in 162 countries. They got the UN Secretary General, 18 cabinet ministers, and countless politicians to join the marches. President Obama responded to the climate march saying, our citizens keep marching. We cannot pretend we do not hear them. After big oil and coal, the next corporate lobby targeted last year by such groups as Avaz was Monsanto. In Argentina, in 2014, when Monsanto tried to extend its grip over the global food chain with a massive new seed factory, Avaz members stood side by side with a local movement and actually stopped Latin America's largest GM seed plant from being built. As you know, Monsanto's non-reproducing seeds have caused 200,000 farmer suicides in India. Now, Monsanto is a $600 billion corporation. Global social movements now work with local people to stop some of the worst excesses of large corporations who don't care for the planet. They do this by launching million-strong petitions and flooding the inboxes of decision-makers with thousands of messages. They work with top lawyers on briefings, in this case, that showed Monsanto's environmental assessment was illegal and made a splash in the media that way. And they released a poll 
showing that two-thirds of town residents in the area concerned opposed the plant, and the plant was not built. Now, my fourth reason why, uh, why, big, uh, why business people, and especially the leaders of large corporations, uh, may want to think about devoting their skills to the planet is that their executives are asking for purpose and meaning at work. I advise the uh, executive teams of a number of large corporations. And what these executives, apparently at the top of their game, tell me, leaves me in shock. Many feel so stressed by daily pressures that their physical symptoms are alarming. They've reached the point where um, they actually feel that KPIs, key performance indicators, have become meaningless. Meaningless to their staff, and values have become empty concepts. Quarterly figures dominate everything and preclude any consideration of the environment, ecology, or even the human needs of people who work in the companies. They feel that the moral compass has, as we would say in British slang, done a bunk, has disappeared. Many express their need for a sense of purpose at work and the time to align what they do every day with what's happening in the wider world. But they say that they want to make a contribution, to feel there's meaning in what they do every day. So now moving on to the what. What are some of the options for devoting business skills to the good of the planet? First of all, prioritizing social and environmental entrepreneurship. The dominant ideology of corporate business to date has largely understood to mean that corporate boards have a duty to shareholders to maximize profit and investors' returns. But profit, as we know, comes at a price to the environment, but also to society's needs as a whole and to the health of employees. So the World um, Future Council has um, designed some future just policies which enable companies to signal appropriately to the market how they can lead the way in securing a sustainable future by pursuing a broader mandate with the correct legal frameworks to reach social and environmental goals. And such frameworks already exist, and corporations are now beginning to be provided with the tools to allow them to connect both private and public interests where profit is not at the expense of society as a, as a whole, and sustainability is key. And for details, I commend you to the Global Policy Action Plan of the World Future Council. Secondly, what businesses can do is to mandate ecologically intelligent design and production. Business as usual is understood to mean a linear model of production, and it's now called designing for landfill, which continues to drain our planet of large quantities of rare earth minerals and non-renewable resources at a totally unsustainable rate. <clears throat> Currently, 90% of raw materials used in the manufacturing process become waste before the product even leaves the factory. Then 80% of these products are thrown away within the first six months of, pro of purchase. So companies need to fundamentally rethink the design and manufacturing of their products. By using ecologically intelligent policy, they can meet new industry standards that would be rewarded by the marketplace. Such standards can yield a turning point in patterns of energy and resource demand. Through the usage of circular economy processes, one is called cradle to cradle, manufacturers can implement more effective long-term planning strategies of energy and material consumption. 
increasing productivity, as well as reducing operating costs. Thirdly, they can encourage value-based sustainable consumption. Unprecedented production capacities now and the rise of the advertising industry have promoted a global consumer culture which has become the principal means of satisfying or trying to satisfy human desires and achieving happiness. This value-free consumption is an illusion. We've now reached a stage where this question must be directly tackled. Policymakers must now encourage consumers to make value-based consumption choices that don't threaten our shared future. Now, some companies are really setting the pace. <clears throat> In 2014, Tesla joined the open source movement, making its patent portfolio, which is massively valuable, available to anyone with the aim of, of advancing electric vehicle technology. And tes Tesla shares jumped 12% within a week of that announcement. So you're seeing the market is rewarding this kind of movement. So now to my last section, which is on the how. How business people can devote their skills to the, to the good of the planet. First of all, educate your teams in global realities. Have them watch Deutsche Welle for a start. But a key step in creating a world that works is to become aware of the current reality in our lives and in the world. To observe and confront the facts enable us to see the unworkability and the consequences of our actions. And I would say that unless we're really willing to actually face the facts and look at them and not switch off the television when it's showing unpleasant facts, unless we, we face these facts, we can't work out a way to deal with them. And the current state of the world is often painful to confront and profoundly disturbing to absorb. Nevertheless, it's essential to my way of thinking that we confront these facts if we're, if we're going to change how we live and what we do. So providing your staff, if you're an employer, with news stories that illustrate the state of the planet and the realities of life in other cultures will enable them not only to understand and support your sustainability strategy, but also to contribute to its development. So you get a completely different current of energy and action sweeping through your company. Secondly, and I think this is my favorite, install a guardian of future generations on your board. Now, um, here again, I'm talking about millennials, people between, born between 1980 and the year 2000. The Millennial Insider Program, just inaugurated by Darshia, Darshita Gillis, who grew up in a Mumbai slum, acts to harness the millennial generation and to have them represented in senior power and decision-making structures globally in both public and private sectors. So one of the roles of these guardians of future generations will be to ensure at board level knowledge of and compliance with the renewed United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And then there will then be a network of these guardians of future generations so they're able to link and align their perspectives and to leverage responsibility and reward for the effective achievement of such goals. So they'll be um, using uh, their, their clout on the board to alter funding decisions, regulatory reporting, and board trust appointments. The, there's no point in simply appointing 
a guardian of future generation if they don't have any power. So they must have equal power on the board. And I must say that this morning's discussion shocked me in the tacit assumption I picked up from some that resources, um, particularly oil and gas, can still be exploited. In the case of oil and gas, this I, I can only call stupidity. When the sun, in one hour, provides more energy than the entire world needs in a year. I go to places like Cairo and Abu Dhabi and I don't see any solar panels. I can't believe it. So <clears throat> what these guardians of future generations would be doing is to replace the dated notion of owning resources with the only viable policy for the future, which is stewardship of natural resources, looking after the planet, taking care of the earth and enabling it to regenerate. My second last point would be for, for corporations to develop and publicize a sustainability strategy. Corporate social responsibility programs now produce yawns because they're seen as nice words on paper and not as action. Alert companies are now building sustainability strategies that have teeth by appointing an advisory board of innovative experts, highly respected in their field, and able to design policies that are fit for purpose. For example, policies for environment, carbon emissions, resource scarcity, or labor conditions in low-wage countries. And here's a story to illustrate. Jochen Zeitz, who will be known to many of you, is one of my heroes. Now chairman of Kering's, that's K-E-R-I-N-G, Board Sustainable Development Committee, and a founder of the B Team with Richard Branson, he has a track record in pioneering new values when he was chairman of Puma, or managing director, I think, the company he led with major success for 18 years. Picture this. The scene is a monastery in Banz in southern Germany. And under the ancient arches of a large refectory are the leaders of NGOs, non-governmental organizations, specializing in fair trade, ethical sourcing, and environmental responsibility. And instead of lecturing from the rostrum, they are instead huddled in small groups, deep in deliberation with the executives of Puma Sportswear. I witnessed this two-day dialogue arranged annually by Jochen Zeitz when he was CEO of Puma so that his team could have face-to-face -face conversation with their fiercest critics. Real listening was taking place. The effects were evident on the final evening when Zeitz, who's a firm believer in quantifying impacts, asked the entire gathering a question. He, says, he said, as CEO, I'm aware that, although we've done a great deal better than most, we've hardly yet scratched the surface of the actions that we as a company need to take to be ethical, sustainable, and fair. My question to you is, should I say this when I release our annual figures to the press next week? Urgent murmuring in the room, culminating in a cons consensus that yes, he should do this, even at the risk that the share price might wobble. He did. It didn't. So coming to my final how point is to meet the expressed need for meaning and purpose at work. I'm certain that a different future for all of humanity is possible if leaders wake up. Interesting, interestingly, this is beginning to happen now in some parts of the corporate world. Reflection, mindfulness, and inner work are now seen as an essential tool 
in many leading companies, extensively, extensively featured in the Financial Times and on the cover of Time magazine. But waking up means more than sitting quietly in meditation. It means the kind of self-awareness and self-knowledge that can only be acquired by a process of honest self-questioning. Let me give you an example. Working recently with the global executives of a major international company, I asked them to undertake an exercise sitting in pairs for 40 minutes. They were required to keep eye contact and to listen intently while their partner answered questions like, What's disturbing you in your life? What are you yearning for? What's your highest potential? Each partner took a turn answering, going well below the cognitive to the gut level, and each took a turn listening, which meant giving their partner absolute attention. At first, they hated it. Bodies squirmed with the embarrassment of eye contact and personal honesty. But at the end, they had a new take on this kind of work. They told me, and I quote, 15 minutes of, this, of that kind of communication is worth four hours of discussion. That kind of communication takes a couple of days to learn, and it's then a tool for life. And combined with the radical revision of values and the courage to see beyond personal gain, it's part of the new set of skills that will enable businesses to join the shift in leadership that is beginning to take place globally. If the mantra of the 20th century was, what can I get? The mantra, mantra of this century may well turn out to be, what can I give? Thank you. Thank you very much. Scylla Elworthy delivering our keynote address there, making an appeal for, val for consumption that is not value-free, reminding us that value-free consumption is actually an illusion, uh, suggesting that we need a new narrative in corporate culture, uh, reminding us that we need circular economic processes if we want to achieve sustainability, and suggesting that it would be a very good idea to prioritize social and environmental entrepreneurship. We now have about 15 minutes for Q&A uh, with Sela Elworthy. So we have a number of people working with the Global Media Forum uh, walking around. They're wearing uh, golden scarves. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and we'll try to get one, a microphone to you very quickly. I would ask you to please identify yourself, and if possible, formulate your, your question succinctly. Um, we're trying to avoid monologues for, for lack of time. Uh, so if you have a question for Scylla Elworthy, this would be the time to ask it. Any, any questions from the audience? Yes, sir, here in the second row. We're going to collect just a couple of questions First, uh, two, two questions, she'll respond, then we'll collect a couple more and move on in that way. So if there's a second question out there, I'll go ahead and have a microphone near you, right to the, to the woman there, great, okay. Madam, I'm Chris Jumpelt, I'm with Deutsche Welle. I'd like to know what's your primary incentive for a CEO to make him the first mover? What's my primary incentive for a CEO to be the first mover? Tesla's shares went up 12%. There's a very, very concise answer. Yes. Um, my name is Manjeet Kripalani, and I work at a foreign policy think tank called Gateway House. We have a uh, Gandhi Peace Fellow, and her primary research is on the concept of trusteeship. Uh, you talked about stewardship. We are trying to get corporate executives to understand that it's sort of the same thing. Stewardship has become a very trendy word, but for some reason they do not comprehend 
trusteeship. So perhaps you can help because uh, most corporations think we're crackpots. Well, um, I think it was, uh, was it Gandhi who said, um, first they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Um, so you, one must expect when you bring up what are thought to be new concepts to, to excite opposition, ridicule, cynicism. Um, don't worry about it, just keep going. Trusteeship is a wonderful word. And if you lay out your description of what it means and keep repeating that, eventually people will get it. Okay, thank you very much for the inspiring speech. Uh, my name is Tijan from Senegal. Uh, one very brief question. W who did the, uh, the, the, the survey that you communicated to us? with the millennials. I can give you the website. Um, I, I can email it to you if you, give me your, if, if you give me your email address. But there's a lot of research done on millennial uh, attitudes and views and requirements. Many of them are laying down criteria uh, for joining a company now. I think there were nine criteria in the last Hi, um, my name is Kate. Um, I'm a trainee with Deutsche Welle. Um, I have a question actually about millennials. You, thank you so much, first of all, for mentioning us in your speech. We're often forgotten. And I'm wondering, um, how can millennials actually get more involved in corporations, but even in our government and democracy in general, when our voices are normally pushed out or not listened to on the world stage and on the national stage? Um, this, this incentive of um, putting millennials on the boards of corporations and on the governing councils of international bodies is just beginning. Um, and because millennials are, f are tired of sustainability in a way, they've gone beyond it, they are advocating regeneration, assisting the planet to regenerate, to reproduce its clean water, its, uh, and to reforest. Um, so they are becoming known as the regeneration generation, which I think is very apt. So again, you could Google somebody called Darshita Gillis, D-A-R-S-H-I-T-A, G-I-L-L-I-E-S, who made a TED talk about uh, two months ago in St. Andrews in Scotland, where she launched this idea of the millennials being on boards of companies. And it's an idea that was really begun by the World Future Council, but at government level. And now she's taking it to the level of corporations. And, um, she will happily respond to you and give you details of how it's developing. But she was immediately contacted by the UN and by four or five very large international governmental organizations. So it's, I think it's an idea whose time has come. You're certainly not the forgotten generation. The gentleman there. Yeah, thank you. A uh, very, very uh, interesting and inspiring session. I wanted to check our uh, concern. You identify yourself, Okay, please. my name is Kingsley Bangwell. I work with a youth group in Nigeria called Youngsters Foundation. I wanted to check in your work and um, around the millennials, um, have you worked with African corporations? Do you, what's your perception of how African corporations and board will receive uh, this narrative about having millennials in the board? Yeah. Uh, I haven't personally worked with uh, African-owned corporations. I've worked with corporations where there are many African people who work there. So I don't think I can answer your question adequately. Have you got an answer for me? Do you feel that African-owned corporations would react differently? 
Yeah, well, taken from especially the uh, political space where the millennials have been excluded from democratic governance and political leadership, I would assume, and my perception will be, it should be the same in the uh, private sector where millennials are, are where corporations are driven by majorly people over 50 and still have their perception about the capacity and the roles millennials can play at that level. Yeah, in, in, in the UK, where it concerns very largely British people, we call them pale, male, and stale. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Uh, the gentleman before me basically asked the question I had to ask. And I just identify yourself. Uh, what if you could. I would like to know is Sorry. whether you plan to have any kind of interaction with the African big lions who hold the strings of power and exclude the millennials. If you could just identify yourself, please. Uh, my name is Tsafa Gandhi. I'm sorry. I'm a media observer from Cameroon. Thank you. Um, so far, I have not. Um, I've had my work cut out with um, an NGO I started in 2002 called Peace Direct, which starts um, and encourages locally-led peace-building initiatives. So I've had a lot of interaction with people in many conflict areas, including in Africa, on that score. But this area of working with corporations is only about three years old for me, so I'd be delighted to be invited. Julio Lopez from Peru. I want to know what you think about the links between uh, COP anyone in Paris and the Millennium Objective for Goals. Sorry, did you say, did you say top down power and millennial? Huh? The difference between? Between COP, do you know, remember the COP in Paris this year in December. Oh, COP okay. and the millennium. Okay. okay, got you. Um, I think we've yet to see what the full impact of millennials will be, but they've, to my knowledge, they've tried to bring their impact in at all the pre-meetings, but not very successfully, I don't think, so far. I think the thing to notice about um, both millennials and social, young social entrepreneurs with whom I've worked very closely is that it's, a, it's what you might call a, a, a bottom-up movement as opposed to top-down. The structures that we're accustomed to are top-down decision-making structures, and they're, they're very creaky and very rigid. What's, in my uh, estimation, is the incoming social structure is what you might call green shoots coming up through concrete. So these are initiatives taken um, by, for example, the kind of young social entrepreneurs who come now every year to Hamburg to the Do School and I work with them there, and there they're provided with both the hard skills and the soft skills, hard skills being how to build a website, how to build a team, how to raise money and so forth, and the soft skills, namely how to communicate, how to resolve conflict in your team, how to reach out in a genuine way. So these young social entrepreneurs come from all over the world. There are about 200 applications for every place, and they then get a challenge, something that they must solve as a body of 20 people, and then they go back to their countries to put their own social entrepreneurial projects into practice. So I think what we're witnessing, I mentioned that to you because what we're witnessing now, I think, is an upsurge of younger people who are not willing to accept the status quo. And we're just beginning to see, especially through social media, what their effect can be. And that effect is felt through some of the organizations like Avaz, Some of Us, 38 Degrees, and so forth, which if you haven't uh, heard about them, I urge you to do. Google them. Avaz is A-V-A-A-Z. Some of Us is exactly S-U-M-O-F-U-S. Uh, 38 degrees is exactly what it sounds like. So just one more question from back there. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very, very much. I was actually thinking that you remind me very much of my mentor, Professor Wangari Madhai. And you make so, me if want you could to just come. identify yourself, um, please. The quest, my name is Ruz Washuka. I'm a co-founder of the Voice of Women Initiative. And my concern is that women from the grassroots sometimes are not considered as experts or considered as bringing anything of worth in um, shaping our future agenda. Now, I just want to know how the Voice of Women Initiative can bring these voices and these expertise of grassroots women to rising women, rising world, and how really the feminine can balance with the masculine. Thank you. Oh, thank you for asking that. And I would love to learn more about your organization because you're exactly on track with uh, another huge phenomenon of our time, which is that um, f forget about uh, feminism, forget about equality of the sexes. What we're talking about here is the, what I would call the deep feminine, which is perfectly accessible to men as well as to women just as the deep masculine is available to both genders. But our society has been dominated by the thinking of what you might call the masculine for 3,000 years. And what has to happen now is that the, the feminine, it would be called the yin in, in East Asia, the yin to bring, back, bring it back into balance with the yang. And then we will have naturally an inclination to care for the planet, to be sustainable, to, uh, to do all the things that we need now to ensure that there's a future for humanity. So Rising Women, Rising World is doing exactly that. We've identified 12 wise women from all different disciplines, from all different cultures of the world, who are mapping out what such a future with the yin back in balance with the yang would look like so that it's not just a pie in the sky. And they back that up by showing all the examples of how this is already happening, which I'm sure is true of your members. So the more examples we can get by collaborating with organizations such as yours, we'd be very happy. Thank you. And thank you all. Thank you so much. Scylla Elworthy, our keynote. It's a great pleasure having you here. Well, here we are, after two and a half days of the Global Media Forum 2015, it is finally drawing to a close. As ever, we have a lot to digest. We've gone through a lot of material, some of it very heavy in the past few days, and there's been a lot of activity on social media. Before I go into a couple of my small, tiny summary, and we move to the final concluding remarks from DW's Director General. We're going to ask Jakob Leon, who is heading our social media team, to give us a, a brief summary of what has been happening on, in the world of social, social media around the Global Media Forum. I know that each of our individual uh, workshops, each of the plenary sessions had its own hashtag for the Global Media Forum. And I'm just wondering all together, if you put it all together, Jakob, how successful was this year's Global Media Forum? As far as we are concerned, and by we, I mean Within the social media, social world. media team, uh, Global Media Forum 2015 was a complete success. Uh, we were among 10 most discussed topics in Germany, Austria, and South Africa. On Monday, we were even the, on the first place in Germany and seventh in Southern Africa. So a big thank you to all of you here and, of course, to all the users around the globe for the support. Uh, we've read over 5,000 tweets with the hashtag DW underscore GMF since Monday, and I have to say we really enjoyed it. A lot of you shared an amazing content, uh, comments, thoughts, questions in English, Arabic, German, Spanish. Still, sorry if we didn't respond or use your questions during all those uh, plenary sessions um, as time we have had was limited, as you know. And I also apologize if we pronounced your name wrongly. <laughs> um, no problem. 
The, um, among the, all, all the events, and there were dozens and dozens of events here, I'm just wondering which one got the most attention. Was there any one particular one that uh, stuck out? The most popular uh, tweets, topic, and events we have had on social media in the last three days were related to Deutsche Welle's TV channel launch and uh, Bob's award ceremony. Not I'm surprising. We have reached over 250,000 impressions, but to be fair, and uh, this is supposed to sound ironic, maybe also because of the fact that our hashtag was uh, spammed by some users in Russia and also by so-called Islamic State. Luckily, all that content was uh, removed in the meantime. Anyway, uh, talking about um, GMF tweet highlights, our top tweet is um, the one posted right before the new Deutsche Welle TV channel started with the broadcast on Monday with the following words, three, two, one, Deutsche Welle English Channel is live, and with the picture of uh, an apparently very popular red button. Um, Raif Badavi, with uh, Bob's Freedom of Speech Prize awarded Saudi blogger, got a lot of attention yesterday. One of the strongest tweets was uh, roaring applause at the Bob's Award Ceremony for all the winners, a symbol to the world. But of course, social media activity was also quite high uh, during um, all those plenary sessions like foreign policy in um, 140 characters, reporting on frozen conflicts beyond social media and uh, many other workshops. There were a lot of very heavy topics uh, dealt with here over the past two and a half days. And I know there was a lot of response. Uh, I, was, I was following the, the Twitter feed myself. I'm just wondering if there was anything entertaining or lighter in terms of... Uh... Oh, yes. Um, I've already mentioned uh, the one it was posted on Tuesday, quite entertaining tweet, and uh, coming from uh, Maximiliane Koshik, who wrote, struggling with the sliding chair at the plenary chamber. <laughs> or the one uh, Jess Cruz posted, to whoever took my umbrella near the front desk, that was not very nice, but I will forgive you for making me walk in the rain if you return it by tomorrow. Uh, Jess, if you're here, um, I hope you got your umbrella back. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, Jakob Leon and the social media team at the Global Media Forum. We've engaged in some fascinating plenary discussions over the past two and a half days, some of them hosted by colleagues of mine at DW News. We've taken in thought-provoking keynotes, today's being no exception. We've expanded our minds through a series of, of highly relevant workshops, 34 in all the way I count them. And we've had very valuable international networking opportunities, um, last night being a great example. I, I sat down at a table just randomly and found myself uh, suddenly in conversation with people from Hong Kong, from Angola, from Brazil and South Africa, just in my immediate vicinity. It was a marvelous conversation. And although I wouldn't necessarily advise putting this on your expense account, if you happen to have one, uh, we actually had some fun, too. That uh, Ryan Cruz on Monday evening was uh, hugely entertaining, despite the rain. We've also had some very poignant moments at this Global Media Forum. The Bob's Awards ceremony yesterday was very moving. It reminded me, reminded us of the determination, creativity, and sacrifice of those who are utilizing digital media to advance the cause of human rights, of press freedom, of freedom of expression. But alas, like so many good things, uh, the Global Media Forum must come to an end. Fortunately, we have next years to look forward to. Well, to wrap things up and put it all in perspective, it is my honor to introduce once again DW's Director General, Peter Limbaugh. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you nearly did a final speech already, so <laughs> there's not much to leave for me, but I think I will find some, some thoughts. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much, Dr. Elfworthy, for this uh, inspiring speech. Um, as a CEO and manager talking after you, maybe normally would be a challenge, but uh, I think uh, leading DW makes us uh, some kind of a bit special and um, because as I said um, a 
couple of weeks ago to our management team when we had a management meeting that uh, our privilege is that there is meaning in what we do. And this is something which is, uh, I think, uh, also seen here when you see the spirit of this Global Media Forum. You can feel it a bit that we are dedicated to bring in information and news to the world. And there is meaning, and this is something I'm very proud of. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, this eighth edition of our annual conference series is drawing to a close. Although the weather, Mr. Martin mentioned it, was gray and rainy, it didn't dampen the good atmosphere surrounding our discussions, workshops, and networking or social events like boat trips. We had this moving moments with the bots. Thank you also, Jafar, for bringing us a very good and really moving emotional quarter of an hour, three quarters of an hour. Media and foreign policy in the digital age, our theme this year has proven to be very relevant topic, heavily discussed also in social media, media, and just how indispensable quality media are in the context of foreign policy and diplomacy has been echoed throughout many of the workshops. It is the anchor of rather the navigational markers guiding us through a sea of useless, questionable information. There was also consensus on the fact that quality media is built on the foundation of a strong internal compass, taking a clear stance. By simply going with the flow of the mainstream, you run the risk of losing relevance. Stance is based on values. The digital age is also an era of competing value systems, a struggle which predominantly plays itself out through the media. Many guest speakers over the past few days have referred to the efforts in authoritarian systems to suppress unwanted information or drown it down with its own powerful media. There were many references to Russian propaganda. The challenge is to respond to it not with mere counter-propaganda, this is not our business, but to respond with bold, surprising, fresh, and well-founded journalism. Deutsche Welle's response to the global competition to shape public opinion is to inform it by launching, also launching, our new English language television programming. I'm very pleased and grateful that you, Deutsche Welle's dear friends and fans, could be here with us to celebrate this kickoff. Our programming stands for something that was also discussed in depth here at the Global Media Forum, the meaning of values and conveying them. Values such as freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom to express your own opinion. Those are the values that Deutsche Welle stands for. In many of the talks over the past three days, it has become very clear how essential the triad of media, freedom, and values is to peaceful coexistence in our globalized world. So it is with great pleasure that I can announce to you today the theme of the 2016th Global Media Forum. It will be Media, Freedom, Values. I warmly invite you to mark your calendars and join us again next year. It will be in June again, hopefully with better weather, I think the 13th to the 15th June here in Bonn, the sun will be shining. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, an international conference like the Global Media Forum wouldn't be possible without all the many people who design and organize it and make it happen. My sincere thanks goes to the entire team of the organizers. Uh, I would like to thank also um, many partner organizations who helped to shape the conference with their workshops, presentations, and speeches. They helped to make the conference a dynamic event with global appeal. <laughs> Special thanks go out to our co-host, the Foundation for International Dialogue, of the Sparkasse Savings Bank in Bonn, and to the Germany's Federal Foreign Office, 
the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, the City of Bonn, and the Robert Bosch Foundation. Without them, one has clearly uh, one has to make this point. Without them, there wouldn't be this conference. So thank them all again. So I look forward to seeing you back in Bonn in next year and um, have fun in the coming year. Have a safe trip home. And uh, it's been a great conference. I learned a lot. And uh, I'm looking forward to keep on discussing with you. Thank you very much. And that concludes this year's Global Media Forum. I want to wish you all as well a safe trip home. And please do leave your headsets at the front or just leave them on the table, but please do not take them with you. I invite you all also to watch uh, DW News, the all new DW News. Uh, you've, I'm Rita Chima, my colleague Brian Thomas, who is here on Monday, myself. You can watch all of us presenting the news uh, on DW News. Please visit our website at dw.com. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>